the big question that we answer, try to answer, at least give an answer to, not the answer, an answer uh, to is how do you make disciples? What's the way of doing that? What's a way of doing that within the context of the church? We would never say this is the way, but it's, it is a way that we have found to be very helpful to not only make disciples, but make reproducing disciples, multiplying disciples. And we use a particular method or tool uh, that we call microgroups. Uh, these are groups of three or four, and you have a description in front of you of these microgroups. Uh, so I want to kind of walk you through this description here initially, because uh, think of microgroups as the container in which we live out our, our faith, uh, the environment, uh, the transformative environment that is created, and I'll go through some of those elements a little bit later on in terms of the elements that they come together in the context of the microgroup uh, experience. But it might be best just to get kind of the definition of what I'm talking about here uh, on the table right away so you have that sense of, of this particular tool. So if you look on your page there, I apologize for how small the print is. Uh, hopefully everybody can, can read that. Um, so what are they? Uh, one person prayerfully invites two or three others to join them on a journey of maturing in Christ as well as learning to disciple others. So first of all, we're defining the size of the group, and the reason for that will become clear. Uh, groups of three or four uh, is a part of the original thing. Uh, the original group multiplies at the completion of discipleship essentials by reaching out to two or three others. Uh, this is the, the tool that we use within our context of our ministry, a, a discipleship curriculum that I've written. Uh, called Discipleship Essentials, uh, Discover the Fullness of Life in Christ, um, and so a guide to building your life uh, in Christ. So once we completed that, that takes usually a year, year and a quarter, uh, to go through that process. Uh, everybody has a chance to lead the group uh, multiple, multiple times in a small group setting. And then at the end of that period of time, uh, we multiply. Each person in the group is invited to find two or three others uh, in this process of, of transformation has taken place. To use Camarillo Community Church as an example, over a five-year period, they went from zero discipleship groups to about 130 discipleship groups of groups of four that define the entire culture of the church. Let's look at why. Why? Since the mission of the church is to make disciples, there is a need for a specific way to do it. The microgroup effectively accomplishes two very vital things. By focusing on God's word in the context of intimate relationship, growth accelerates. Uh, so uh, we'll talk about the environmental elements that come together in these microgroups to accelerate the growth process uh, in, in people's lives. And the presence of the Holy Spirit obviously is the thing through the work of, the, of God's word to make that happen. And then secondly, through participation in these groups, one learns to create a similar experience for others, thus multiplying disciples. So an organically growing network of disciple making. Uh, I will distinguish this from a program. This is not an upfront program. This is a organic relational amoeba-like network <laughs> that uh, reaches out across the church front and then outside of the church as well. How? Um, central to the microgroup is the agreement to a mutual covenant. Suffice it to say for now that the covenant makes explicit the commitments that each is making to God and each other. Disciple making is fundamentally a relational process of lives sharpening lives. One of the major reasons for accelerated growth is the group members have shifted priorities to make this group a centerpiece of their week. So within Discipleship Essentials, there is a specific covenant. What is a covenant? A covenant is a mutual agreement that states the expectations and commitments in the relationship. And you're all agreeing to this covenant and you're entering into that mutual commitment as a part of being, uh, being in this group. Uh, who? We like these groups, expect these groups to be of the same sex. Men with men, women with women. Uh, transparency and trust is a very vital element in this. So getting down to the place where you can open your lives to each other uh, is absolutely central to the whole transformative process. And so, um, and that's going to happen much more quickly uh, with men, with men and women with women versus uh, them together. Uh, 
maybe I don't even need to explain that. <laughs> maybe that's so obvious that, uh, uh, but obviously men have issues that they need to deal with each other about that would they feel uncomfortable in the presence of women and vice versa, uh, I think would be this, the same, same thing. Uh, when do they meet? Uh, the suggested meeting length is approximately 90 minutes, at least in our US Western context. Uh, we meet once a week for 90 minutes uh, at a time, so it's a fairly uh, intense kind of commitment. I uh, was meeting with some uh, people this morning, they were saying, well, our groups meet once a month. And well, once a month is make, can make it very difficult to develop the kind of intimacy, openness, and transparency uh, that a, a small group is needed. Uh, so since the groups are small, uh, that it is usually possible to find a seam in everybody's schedule. I have a, uh, a group that meets now on Tuesdays at 11.30 in the morning. And we, ha we meet at a, a, a restaurant, a coffee shop, and to, to goes to 12.45. Why do we meet at that time? Well, two of the men in my group are in their early 30s. They both have uh, children under the age of three, <laughs> two kids under the age of three. And as I've listened to their schedules, <laughs> Uh, it's like, when do we find time to meet? Uh, in the morning, they're obviously getting the kids up and getting ready to go out the door, uh, transporting them to one place or another, or making sure child care takes place because both spouses work in both of these homes. Um, it, it's in the afternoon, and it's just trying to take care of, care of kids again and uh, putting them to bed at night at by 8.30 in the evening. And as they say to me, I can barely talk to my wife you know, <laughs> with, during this time. You know, by the time it's time to talk to my wife, I'm exhausted, you know, in the evening. So it's a matter of, gosh, where does this fit into our schedule? So this is the best time that we could come up with, uh, even though it may not be ideal. They could take some time off the midday from their work to make, make this happen on a fairly regular basis. So the idea of it being small is that you can be flexible and to figure out when and where you can meet. Usually we try to meet in places where you can be open and honest, uh, and we try to find a, a little niche in the restaurant that we're in so that we can be sort of a, away from everybody else. And then where do you meet? Uh, that's kind of what I was just saying, a safe place. Um, sometimes it's, I've met in boardrooms of offices, law, law offices, insurance offices, uh, before anybody came to work uh, at those places very early in the morning, met in church space, in living rooms, um, you know, all kinds of places, but you want kind of a safe space in which to meet. Okay, so that's kind of a brief introduction uh, to microgroups, and I'll just pause here uh, to see uh, what questions does that raise, because uh, I wanted this to be the backdrop against which I do uh, the rest of my presentation to, to realize that this is kind of the tool uh, that we use. So what's a successful discipleship journey look like? If we had time, I would have uh, Pastor Ralph up here uh, telling us of what that looked like in terms of the Camarillo Community Church and what does the end in mind uh, look like. Uh, so, but we have a limited amount of time, I know. <laughs> and so, but what are the elements uh, that contribute? So this session is really a, a very much an overview session. Uh, I'll, I'll try to kind of skate through some of these elements uh, and have you interact over them. But uh, so a journey requires three elements. Uh, it requires a vehicle uh, to get there. Uh, so the, in, the relational environment is the vehicle, and I've just described to you kind of that vehicle, which is the microgroup. That's the, the focus of attention. Uh, and then every vehicle needs a driver. It needs to have somebody behind the wheel uh, driving it. And that's the intentional leader, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the role of the intentional leader as a part of this. And then uh, you need a GPS, right? How many of us use GPSs on a regular basis? Everybody in this room does, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, so you need a map. You need a, a way to get to where you're going. And that's what we call the curriculum. Um, so the, the material that you are walking through over time uh, that will lay out the discipleship journey. Uh, we say that we need a foundational curriculum. Uh, to, lay under each person's life, and therefore then it becomes kind of foundational for the broader culture of the church uh, as, as well. So those three elements. So we're gonna start here 
uh, spend a little bit more time on this element than the other two because this environment is absolutely critical uh, for a healthy experience together. So we're gonna focus in on um, kind of the relational environment here. I'm gonna skip through some elements here for the sake of time and uh, ask you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter six, verses 12 and 13. Let's ground uh, what we are doing in scriptural foundations and Jesus' model of how he went about making disciples. I find that uh, we have the model of disciple making right before us in scripture, but we tend to ignore it. And uh, we go after other ways of doing church life. And uh, I know as pastors, um, we are taught to be shepherds of the flock and uh, care for the entire spiritual needs of the congregation and be available to all people at all times. Uh, And we have learned a model of pastoral ministry that actually I think creates dependency Uh, upon us rather than equipping the saints for the work of ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. But Jesus gives us a model uh, of how to carry out um, this ministry. And uh, I would suggest that we follow that model. What a wonderful thing that would be (laughs) if we did. So let's turn to Luke 6, verses 12 and 13. Luke seems to indicate almost right away that this is a very important moment in Jesus' ministry. Why, why do we th- think that? It says, one of those days, Jesus sent out, out, out on the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. It's almost as if Luke is saying, stop right here. This is important. Pay attention. Jesus is spending all night in prayer. What is he praying about? Well, it says the next day when morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them whom he would designate as apostles. Okay, so this is a strategic moment in Jesus' ministry. Maybe he's been at it some six months. If you go back in Luke, uh, you can see that Jesus has already gathered up uh, Peter, James, and John, Matthew, the tax collector. But there's apparently a larger group of disciples at this point that are itinerating with Jesus. And so now he's saying this is the time to designate a subset of this larger group whom we'll call apostles, my inner leadership core, uh, and whom Jesus is going to invest his life and spend uh, his time uh, with them. I, I oftentimes like to just kind of speculate, you know, if, if I could have been in earshot of Jesus praying that night, knowing what was coming the next day, what would Jesus have been praying about? What do you think would have been on his heart? But let me focus in on on one, I think, key issue here. Jesus always had the transition in mind from his ministry to them. Jesus was going to the Father, and he was going to turn his ministry over to these 11, um, once Judas has absented himself. And and so when you go to John chapter 17, you will note that that is what we call Jesus' high priestly prayer. He's praying for his disciples there at the end. He's fully conscious that his ministry is now uh, come to, coming to a close with the cross right before him. And in John 17, 4, Jesus says this amazing thing. He says, I've glorified you, Father, on earth, having accomplished the work you have given me to do. Now, wait a minute, Jesus. You haven't even gone to the cross yet. How could you have accomplished the work that was given them to him to do? It's interesting. If you look up that word accomplished or finished or completed, it's exactly the same word that Jesus uses on the cross when he says it is finished in John chapter 19. So what does that tell us about the importance of Jesus' investment in a few? He was staking his ministry on the faithfulness of these 11. He was getting them ready for this transition. This was going to be his legacy, in a sense, on a human level. Uh, The work of the Spirit, of course, is going to come and empower these uh, disciples to be able to accomplish what they were. So what I'm trying to stress here is the importance of our investment in a few and our giving of ourselves. If I were to ask you, even today, 
Um, who is it that you're spending regular time with in order to help them become all that God wants them to be? Do you have people in your life that you're doing that with? Maybe many, many of you would, but maybe many of us would not either in terms of focusing in on that agenda. So I'm going to move us along here uh, and to look at, um, I think I'm going to skip through some of this to get us right to this, the power of personal invitation. What sets this approach to disciple making apart maybe from other approaches to disciple making? Uh, we like to contrast this with our programmatic mentality that we have in life of the church. We try to make pro disciples through programs. Come join our 10-week discipleship program. You all sign up for this program, and we'll walk through this class where we'll cover discipleship material uh, during this time together, and perhaps disciples will pop out the other end of the program, <laughs> we hope. Uh, well, what we're saying is, no, it's a journey of relationship. It's an invitation to relationship. And so the very first step in all of this is, is prayer. We follow Jesus' model. Jesus spent all night in prayer. He waited until those settled names were upon his heart, and then he publicly identified them and said, you are going to be a part of my inner core. Uh, we're simply asking you to pray for two or three other people and to see who it is that God would lead you to to invest in on a, on a regular basis and wait for that settled conviction of the Holy Spirit. So when you go to a person, you can offer them an, an invitation. And that's the way I like to do it. And then uh, how is this different, well, than a program? Uh, on a Sunday morning, so maybe a representative of staff gets up on a, in front of the church as a whole and you announce the start of a program and you say, you all go sign up. How many people sign up? Because nobody thinks you're talking to them, right? <laughs> uh, it's about the other people that should be signing up for this, this program. But if you're going and making a personal invitation, my brother, give me your name. Ben. So Ben, I, I've been praying about something. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to start a new group. And the purpose of this group is to help us all kind of grow towards maturity in Christ and, and also equip us to disciple other people as well. And as I've been praying about this, the Lord has just put your name on my heart. And I just see a hunger in you for going deeper in the Lord. And would you prayerfully consider joining me and maybe a couple of other people to, on a regular basis to get close to each other and just encourage each other uh, around some uh, disciple-making foundational curriculum? Uh, would you consider praying about that? Sure. Would you? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, so we want somebody, you look somebody in the eye, you're making a personal invitation, uh, you're asking them to consider this uh, as a part of what your life uh, is all about. So that's a lot of what sets us apart uh, from our usual programmatic approach. Let me give you some contrasts uh, between the program and relationship on four levels here. Uh, first of all, discipleship groups are about intimacy. Usually programs are about information. Uh, come and learn the content of a program, and then uh, hopefully if you get more information that that will lead to transformation. That's not necessarily the case. Oftentimes it's a teacher transferring their information to you. Uh, they're taking their full picture and pouring it into your empty picture. And uh, whereas we're saying, no, that truth best settles in when we're opening our lives to each other in an intimate uh, kind of relationship. And when we are then you know, incorporating that into our inner being. Second element here is mutual participation versus one on behalf of the many. Uh, this is a program today. Uh, I've come prepared with content. You are, have an outline in front of you. I'm walking you through some content. Uh, but there's minimal participation on your part. We're having you discuss around the table. In a group of three or four, everybody comes prepared with the content. They are sharing their own insights into God's word. Uh, it requires something of them to be a part of that. Uh, what's that old adage? You only get out what you put in. Um, we think, mistakenly, I believe, that we can make disciples by preaching at each other in a worship service. Even Jesus 
The greatest preacher who ever lived did not rely on his own preaching to make disciples. We are glad that he preached because we got a lot of good content <laughs> in Scripture. But what did he rely on? The investment in a few. If we could have made disciples by preaching, the job would have been done a long time ago. Yes, we need preaching. I love to preach myself. I'm not denigrating it, but you need to know the place of it in the overall context. So the more people are invested in mutual participation, uh, the better. Number three, maybe the most important element on this list, customized versus synchronized. The, the value of a small unit like the three or four is that each person can be known on their faith journey. You can customize to the needs. Everybody has a, their own story. You know, I would like to say, look around the room. Is, are any two people look alike in this room? Um, I don't think so. Everybody has their own story, their own challenges, their own ways of learning, their own unique uh, places in their own journey of faith that they need to address, and we need to be known in that context. And that's the value of having the customized uh, approach versus walking through a 10-week program where you're at the same place at the same time. Every one of the discipleship groups has its own life. There's no two groups that have the same life. They're all unique to the individuals in that group. They, they all take their own time because of the issues that are going on. And then finally, life change accountability versus content accountability. Oftentimes in uh, discipleship programs, uh, it's about um, have you filled in the answers in the workbook? You know, have you memorized your scripture? <laughs> uh, you know, that's the content accountability. That's not what we're after in these discipleship groups. We're after life change. We're after conformity to the image and likeness of Christ. And that means you got to identify those areas in your own life that are not in conformity to the image and likeness of Christ and share that with each other and pray about that with each other and so that we can uh, see that kind of life change take place.